when lion walks everyone runs away even an elephant is scared yet the fact is lion is not as strong as the elephant is a question worth thinking about it <coughs> and the scientists when they studied this behavior they came up with an understanding and conclusion they said <coughs> when a lion sees an elephant he does not see an elephant he sees a lunch what he sees he does not see that huge elephant he sees his lunch but when an elephant sees the lion what he sees he sees an eater somebody who's going to devour me where is the difference where is the difference the difference lies in the belief system of the lion and of that of the elephant lion believe that whoever it is i can devour i can make anyone as my breakfast lunch and dinner and in between i can take snacks sometimes depending depending on the availability of the audience but when other creature sees them they immediately think oh the lion is going to devour us although an elephant is far much more powerful you agree upon it once again i want all of you to repeat after me all behavior is driven by belief loudly please so what we need to do if you want to be successful if you want to get rid of this attitude i cannot we need to change our belief how are we going to change our belief i'll be talking soon about it let's think more on this belief i don't know if you are really convinced by my two examples but i'll give you more examples let's take a look at the power of belief that we have uh for this i'll need to do a little exercise and i don't know if we can really do it here uh let's do one thing i want all of you to get up from your place it's good once in a while you will not fall asleep it's too comfortable as a place okay you have to hear me very carefully okay i don't want you to pluck out anyone's eye here because i'm going to ask you to do some actions you have to move around a little bit so uh definitely everyone can't do it because the seats are close by we'll see how how well we can do it so raise your right hand and at least take not the straight if possible for you for those of you possible if they can maintain a one arm distance from your neighbor then you keep standing and you move towards the aisle and those who cannot you sit down please <laughs> those who cannot you sit down allow others to go through this exercise because lack of space you can a little bit move around i will request everyone on their feet try it out and if you are not able to find space please sit down others can stand up observe them do that this exercise are you all okay please be careful i'm going to ask you to move please don't hurt anyone so make sure you are comfortably standing at a one arm distance all agreed fine enough so you have to hear me carefully what i'm going to ask you now you raise your arm straight up to the height of your shoulder not above the shoulder only have your index finger on and close all the other three fingers okay now you have to stretch now don't move your feet keep your feet firm with your waist line you have to move your waist you have to turn around clockwise direction as far as you believe you can do it please continue and turn around in a clockwise direction don't move your feet you have to just turn around and stretch as far as you can stretch and, and you know and make sure you see where you are able to turn how far you will turn be careful huh? don't turn too much you don't want accidents here be comfortable whatever you are comfortable with all right and you have identified how far you are able to turn okay bring back your right arm back and keep your arm, arms down please keep standing couple of more minutes okay be comfortable i want all of you now to close your eyes you are not going to do any physical action <clears throat> we are going to run through something called as a visualization exercise okay <clears throat> take a three deep breaths take three deep breaths <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. Ready now? Now you have to go through a visualization. You don't have to act, but in your mind you have to do a visualization. Now in your mind you're visualizing that you're again raising your right hand, bringing it up up to the shoulder height. In your mind you're not doing any physical action. It's a visualization. And when you raise your right hand up, again I'm asking you to move clockwise. 
स्ट्रेच एज फार यू कैन पॉसिबली डू रेदर आई एम टेलिंग यू टू स्ट्रेच टू टाइम्स और वॉट यू स्ट्रेच अर्लियर प्लीज यू हैव टू विजुअलाइज इट थॉरली एंड क्लियरली डोंट गेट डिस्ट्रेक्टेड विद इट थिंक ऑफ योर बॉडी एज अ रबर एज इलास्टिक दैट यू आर एबल टू मूव अराउंड गेट ऑल द स्ट्रेस एंड द पेन आउट ऑफ योर माइंड राइट नाउ थिंक योर सेल्फ इमेजिन यू आर मूविंग टू टाइम्स ऑफ वॉट यू मूवड जस्ट नाउ If you are able to do that say loudly yes. yes. Okay thank you. <laughs> you gave me hope with your yes. All right come back in your mind keep your eyes closed you don't have to please pay attention to what I'm telling you. Keep your hand down again. We are again going to run through a second visualization exercise. Again in your mind you're raising your right hand with your index finger pointed towards the stage up to the shoulder height. Now I again want you to move clockwise. Three times of what you moved just now, not just now, what you moved the first time. Go and keep on stretching yourself in your mind. Think your body as of a rubber and as much as elastic. You're moving three times of what you did in the first go. Don't have any mental blocks that I am or I'm not. Keep moving. You have all the freedom. Anyways, you can imagine anything. so use all imaginative power that you have if you are able to move stretch yourself three times say loudly yes yes okay again bring your hand back keep it next to your uh, legs or the waist now the third and the final visualization exercise again i am asking you to raise your right hand up to the shoulder height again i am asking you to move your right hand in a clockwise direction this time you going to move it four times four times of what you did in the first go don't have any mental blocks again don't think that i cannot think that you can do it you are able to move your body clockwise direction four times of what you did earlier i hope you are able to see it clearly you are able to imagine you are able to visualize if you are able to do so say loudly yes yes all right kindly open your eyes thank you for this exercise uh you deserve a big round of applause for yourself Oh no no don't say don't say I'm not done I'm not done yet that was just to distract you this is the final thing now you're going to act keep your eyes open again raise your right hand pointing towards the stage with your index finger on close your three fingers now i want you again to turn clockwise direction as far as you can clockwise direction stretch yourself as far as you can as far as you can turn yourself stretch as far as yourself now focus on the position where you are pointing now please come back to your original position if you think you are able to stretch far much more than the first time give a big round of applause <laughs> by the way that was a applause for you so thank you <laughs> can you take a seat now So some of you might have noticed you are able to stretch maybe 25% more maybe 50% more it really brings us to a very obvious question a uh, kind attention please come back exercise is not over the main lesson is yet to be drawn and it brings us to a two very obvious question First question you have to answer yes or no loudly were you physically capable of turning that far the first time yes or no again i am repeating the question hear the question carefully were you physically capable of turning that far the first time physically yes or no yes. physically were you capable of turning that far the first time yes or no yes. i still hear some faint no here those who are saying no it means when you did the last time you were not able to move farther if you able to move farther which means you were able to move farther the first time also so your answer should be definitely yes now what was preventing you from doing so the first time if your body had that potential to move that far then why didn't you move it the first time is my question clear your physical form had the capacity to move that far but it could not move the first time what was preventing you from doing so anybody would like to give a response what was preventing you from doing so the first time 
Yes or? It's our belief. I did not believe that I can go that far. Do you all agree? Yes. When I ran through you all through a visualization exercise, I gave you that opportunity to believe that you can go far much more. You can stretch far more what you have just stretched right now. That's the reason we've said stretch twice, thrice and the fourth time. And then when you did final time, of course, you couldn't stretch four times of it, but you stretched far much more. And that is what the power of belief is. If we cultivate right kind of beliefs in our life, we'll definitely give up this attitude of I cannot do it. Our belief determines our attitude and our attitude determines our behavior. When we carry a negative belief system about our own potential, that's the time when we say, I cannot do it. Please repeat after me. All behaviors are belief driven. You sound hungry. You have to be loud. I want you when you walk away from this, this point have got into your mind that I can be a far better person than what I am today. If I stop saying to myself, I cannot, I cannot. Once again, loudly please. All behaviors are belief driven. Are you convinced? Partially? Let me give you more case studies. Let me give you more concrete examples of it. See, these signs or these tricks since time immemorial has been used by spiritualists. And in the modern day, this whole idea of visualization is idea of having a positive belief system is also at large used by the athletes. <coughs> So before we go ahead to that example, what we need to do is we need a change in belief. That was the idea that I want to draw. Now, let's take an example of athletes, as I'm saying, that how they train their mind to believe that I can do something. And a very fa famous example, I'm not sure if any one of you would be aware of this name, Sir Roger Bannister. Uh, would you have a cordless mic? I can walk around, if that is there. <coughs> So this Sir Roger Bannister did something which was completely unbelievable. It was never ever thought in the history of mankind that a person can ever accomplish the task. Hare Krishna, this is better. <coughs> what he did was such a revolution that before that nobody ever thought that it is ever possible for a human to do it. Of course, you should be wondering what he did was such revolutionary. But the irony is, what has not been done for thousands of years, what man thought is impossible, once he did it, everyone started doing it. Once he did it, everyone started doing it. So what is this Roger Bannister is famously known for? And is famously known for running a mile in less than a four minute. It was a belief that if somebody attempts to run a mile in less than a four minute, it was a belief that that person's heart would explode. It was a belief that that person will get a heart attack and he will die on the way. There was a belief the person would not survive if he attempts to run a mile less than four minutes. The obvious question is, we are talking about Roger Bannister here because he ran a mile in less than four minutes. Now the question arises, well how did he do so? If I have to ask you to do a task where everyone is telling you, you cannot do it. The doctors are telling you, the scientists are telling you, the teachers are telling you. Everyone around you is telling you, you cannot do it. And more than that they tell you, if you attempt to do it, you might die. Would anyone here dare to do that? It's difficult, isn't it? Roger Bannister attempted to do something where everyone in the world was saying, you cannot do it. And that's the reason I'm taking this example. To give you a little bit about him, to tell about this character, <coughs> he was not an athlete by profession. He was a neuroscientist. And that's where the magic lies. He understood how the human mind functions. And what he did with himself he trained his mind. He trained his mind by this visualization exercise where he told himself, 
that I can run a mile in three minutes and 59 seconds. He trained himself over a period of time that I can run a mile in three minutes and 59 seconds. And guess what? He did that. He set a record which was never thought would ever establish. He ran a mile in three minutes and 59 seconds. And as I said in the beginning, once he did it, just three months later, someone else broke the record. And today, in the current time, the record stands for three minutes and 43 seconds. And this record initially was set in 1954 by this Roger. If imagine we go back in the time in 1953, and if I come on the stage and tell you, in a week from now, I'm going to run a mile. And I'm going to set a record of three minutes and 43 seconds. All of you are going to laugh out loud at it. This is impossible. Where? What's the reason? What's the difference? What did Roger did with himself that made him run a mile in three minutes and 59 seconds? What did Roger did to himself? He changed his belief system from I cannot to I can. So the change was in his the mind, the thinking pattern. So success is an inside out game. Things have to change in our mind first and then it happens outside. Are we all on the same page? I gave you an example of an athlete. Let's take an example. <coughs> and by the way, just to let you know, in 1954, there was no special advancement in the shoe technology or in the field of nutrition or so forth. Everything was still the same. So the bottom point is, because he trained himself in his mind, visualized that I can do it, he did it. There's a word of caution about visualization that I'll share ahead. I don't want you to just take an idea that I can visualize anything and achieve anything. So that I'll explain later on. So we gave you an example from an athlete. As I said, spiritualists have been using the science of visualization from the you know, beginning of time. And there's a classic example of Srila Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of ISKCON. And that's what I really appreciate about spirituality that fills you with so much positivity. You know, there's nothing, a concept like I cannot. And that was highly characterized by the life of Srila Prabhupada. I'll give one or two examples just to elaborate and, you know, come to this conclusion of this topic of belief system and then move ahead how to cultivate that belief system. <coughs> this is a conversation, uh, this is an incident which probably took back in early 1966. Srila Prabhupada was in New York. He was sitting all alone on a seat in a Tompkins Square Park by himself all alone. He had no means of his survival. He was really poor, poverty stricken at that point of time. He had gone there just to share the message of God and share the message of Bhagavad Gita. He's sitting there in his saintly attire, saintly robes and so forth. And there, a person by the name of Mr. Reuben, a Jewish by birth, who was a bus conductor. When his duty got over, he came to walk in the Tompkins Square Park and he saw this saintly old person sitting on a chair, sitting on a, you know, the park desk by himself. He got very intrigued and he walked up to him and he asked and he began to interact with him. And he asked, who are you, where have you come from, what are you doing here and so forth. And Srila Prabhupada introduced himself as the founder Acharya of International Society for Krishna Consciousness. It was not founded until then. It was not even founded until the next six months. There was no ISKCON existing and Srila Prabhupada introduced himself, I am the founder Acharya of ISKCON. And then, the, of course, obvious question comes, what is this ISKCON? And then Srila Prabhupada went on to explain what this ISKCON is. And he said, we have hundreds of temples all over the world. At that point of time, Prabhupada even didn't have a place for himself to stay. And he's telling Mr. Rubin, we have hundreds of temples all over the world. And then he said, and we have tens and thousands of followers all over the world practicing and living by the message of Bhagavad Gita. And Mr. Rubin, in his own words, right? I was astonished. This gentleman is telling me that he is an Acharya, the founding member of such a big institute, a spiritual organization, yet he is sitting all alone by himself in this park and nobody seems to be around. Yet I could not doubt him because he spoke with such a confidence. 
And guess what? In 1977, Srila Prabhupada left this world. And when he left this world, in a short span of 11 years, Srila Prabhupada opened 108 temples all over the world. And he had more than 10,000 students practicing the life of Bhakti Yoga all over the world. This is called as power of belief. What a strong belief he had, although he was a lone man. To give you another classic example, there was a person who had all the potential, all the strength. In fact, everyone was counting on him that this is a person who's going to change our fortune. This is a person who's going to change our destiny. And everyone knew, even he had known this fact about himself until some time ago. And suddenly, his beliefs got changed. He walks up onto the battlefield and looking at the opposite army and finding his relatives standing opposite to him, he immediately tells, I cannot fight this war. Who was this character? Yes, there's none other than Arjuna. When he walked into the battlefield, see if Duryodhan had any worry in the battlefield, it was Arjuna. He knew this single man can destroy my whole army. If Yudhishtha Maharaj had any hope on anyone, that was an Arjuna. He knew if I have Arjuna with me, I can definitely win this war. Everyone knew about the potential of Arjuna. Arjuna had known about his own potential. Suddenly when he walks onto the battlefield, he's clueless about his own potential. And now he begins to give excuses how he cannot fight. So what is this Bhagavad Gita? And that is where this beautiful conversation between Lord Sri Krishna and Arjuna took place. Yes, some people say it's a religious treatise and so forth. I do agree it's a spiritual book. It has a profound knowledge. At least I can tell for myself, it's a, it's a book of wisdom that can translate your inner world if it is filled with negativity and fill it up with positivity. And that's the power of the message of Bhagavad Gita. I remember a lady which was not in direct contact with me. There was a lady in Bombay. This story was told to me by somebody who gifted her a Bhagavad Gita. And this lady was attempting a suicide in her apartment. She had already hanged a rope on the fan and she was already had climbed up the table and she was putting the noose around her neck when there was a knock on her door. And the knock was so persistent, she couldn't focus on what she was attempting to do. She came rushing to the door and there was a person, a devotee standing at the door and she, he said, I want to give you this book. And that was Bhagavad Gita. And this lady said, no, I'm very busy. Please take it back. He said, ma'am, I have come all this way. Please don't say no. I don't want anything. Please take this book. Okay, what will I get out of this book? And immediately opened a certain section in Bhagavad Gita in second chapter, verse number 20, where he talked about how we are not this body, but far much more than this body. How we are a spirit soul. And he pushed that book into her hand and she, he said, please keep this book, please read if you get time. And if you like it, you can always give a donation to the temple and this said, and he walked away. This lady went inside and he read the stanza about how I am not this physical body. I am a spirit soul and life is meant to be beautiful only if I choose to live it like that. When she understood that point, she gave up the idea of committing a suicide. Soon after she went to the temple, found that man and she said, this is your donation and I would really want to thank you. And he was thinking, what happened so, ha what happened so special? He said, when you were knocking on my door, I was attempting a suicide. Can you see an extreme situation of so much negativity where a person is pushed into committing a suicide? Just reading one verse and one elaboration of that verse, her decision was changed from negative to positive and she's still living and living a far much better life. And that is what the journey of Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna is trying to change the belief system of Arjuna from this attitude of I cannot, I can. Arjuna was not like you and I. He was not an interior design student. But he didn't know how to use a bow and arrow. He was a fighter. He was a Kshatriya. He was highly skilled in it. It is something like that. You go through the all, you know, whatever, three year or four year interior design course. And then I ring you up and I say, you know, I have an assignment for you. And you say, oh, I don't know anything about it. Oh, what do you mean by this? You went to the whole college digit for it. And that's what, while going through this study, while going through this discussion with Krishna, Arjuna finally came to an understanding of, I can. And this is the attitude when I interact with the youngsters of 
the current day and time, people generally lack in them. Because today's generation is highly impatient. Everything is on our hands. You want the food, you don't have to walk to the restaurant. Now they say 30 minutes delivery or 5 minutes delivery, something like that. And if I fail to deliver in 30 minutes, you get a free pizza. Right? You don't have to walk to the shopping mall to purchase a dress for yourself. Go to Amazon. I guess there is a big sale going on today. I hope you are not doing shopping right now. Okay, this is not the time for shopping. If you are doing, then I am going to talk about multitasking. Because the time of impatience, they become so impatient in life, you know, if we can do something which seems so tangible today, then we say, I can. Otherwise, most of the time, the response today is, I cannot. So that brings me to the course of this matter. Again, what we have discussed so far, that all behavior is belief driven. Is it all clear to all of you? Whatever actions we perform is our belief driven, the question arises that. How do I cultivate the right way? Would you like to know that? There is a need for it. If I conclude the program right now, maybe you'll be happy there is uh, some... What, what they call Navaratri dance is going on. But I guess tomorrow onwards you won't be able to bring that positive change in yourself. Here is a very interesting thing. One young boy was walking at the corner of the street and he came across a sculptor. And this is where the title goes to carve out the masterpiece. He saw the sculptor, he was a young boy, he didn't know who sculptor is, what sculptor does. And he saw the sculptor having a big stone slab in front of him and he was hitting the stone slab. And the boy found it pretty amusing and he asked that, what are you doing? He said, I am carving out the lion. And the young boy innocently asked, do you really think the lion exists within the stone slab? And the sculptor said, well come after a week. Come after a week and I'll tell you. And the boy came after a week and there was standing a very beautifully carved lion. And the boy was shocked. And he went to the sculptor and he asked, how did he knew that there was a lion within it? And a very beautiful answer, the sculptor said. He said, the lion was always inside the, inside the stone slab. What I did was I chiseled away. I took off the unnecessary piece of stone that was covering the lion. Similarly, Bhagavad Gita, Lord Sri Krishna says, each one of us are unique and very special. And we have an incredible contribution to make in this world. If only we just recognize our potential. When we talk of success, people generally think to acquire new set of skills. Yes? When they think when we have to be successful, we need to possess, we need to have facilities, we need to have opportunities. I'm going to request you to change your paradigm today. I'm going to say, you're already successful if you begin to identify that. And to really identify that, what you are and what potential you have, you have to act like a sculptor. You have to bring out the masterpiece that is hidden within each one of us, the young or the old or whoever is not present in the audience also or whoever is listening online. We all have that potential. So question comes, what do we need to chisel away? What we need to give up? What we need to remove from ourselves that can help us bring out our true personality? Now this is a subject matter which will take some time. So considering the time that I have with me, I would not elaborate each point. For some points, I'll just give you some snippets. For some points which I feel important, maybe complicated, I may explain it. At the end of the talk, I believe we have that printouts. Yeah, at the end of the talk, what I'm going to speak now, you'll get it as a printed uh, printout. So you can go back, and it is not something very difficult. You can sit and discuss with your peer, and you will know that. So let's begin with what we need to give up in our life. First thing that we really need to give up in our life is this idea, you know, this concept of victim mentality. You know, interestingly, psychologists talk about this concept of victim mentality. When and how a person begin to think about a victim mentality? When he thinks that everyone else owes him something. And when a person does not want to take responsibility is the time when a person takes shelter of this victim mentality. I'll again repeat. When a person thinks that everyone else in the world owes me something, I do not owe them anything. Everyone else owes me something. And 
was the last point. Everyone owes me something and I don't want to take any responsibility is the time the person takes this, you know, shelter of this idea of a victim mentality. So first thing that we need to give up is give up this victim mentality. Recognize your potential and work according to it. Take the control of, of your life in your own hands. And we'll quickly hear a word of wisdom from probably all of you know who the character is. How many of you have seen Kung Fu Panda? Please raise your hands. <laughs> I mean, you can have a whole talk on the movie of Kung Fu Panda, the lessons from Kung Fu Panda. I'm not going to get distracted on it. For today, I'm going to talk about only one lesson, one of my favorites. And here, what the master Ugwe is speaking. This is a statement which is mentioned in the all ancient texts. I thought rather than I speak, Ugwe talking to the character of Kung Fu Panda, if in case you can identify yourself with Kung Fu Panda, may relate to it. Please pay attention. I hope the sound comes. Everyone is telling you, you cannot do it, you cannot do it. And Kung Fu Panda got convinced, I cannot do it. It's kind of victim mentality. And that's the time the master Ogwe comes to him, walks up to him and tells him, you're too worried about life. You're too worried about what was about to happen or what had already happened. And then he makes a beautiful statement. Tomorrow is a mystery. Past is a history. And present is the only gift that we have. Utilize your present, which means say to yourself, I can do it. It is my potential. Rather than saying that I don't have the opportunity, I don't have the facility, I don't have the best of the teachers, I don't have the best of the school, or I don't have the best of the company to work for. Wherever you are, you can do or you can excel if we have the right attitude. Second, Give up on excuses and procrastination. Actually, you know, I sometimes when I interact with people and the kind of brilliant excuses they give, really looks like that they have literally done doctorate in excuses. Perfect excuses. How many of you once in a while have related to yourself giving excuse? Well, that's a part of every one of us, no doubt about it. So do remember when we're talking about the subject matter, there are few things that maybe you can give today and few things you need to work on. And this is one thing that really, really need to work on. There was one boy who just finished his exam and today was his result day. So he went to the school, he got his result and he came back to his home. And his father asked, Beta, tumhara result kaise hai? Mark sheet dikhao. Papa, Sharma ji ka ladka fail ho gaya. <laughs> Beta, main tumhara result ke baare mein puchha, apna mark sheet dikhao. Papa, Khanna ji ki beti fail ho gai. Beta, mein tumhare baare mein puchta hoon, tum apna result dikhao. Papa, Malik ji ka ladka bhi fail ho gaya. And father gets frustrated. You fool, I'm asking you. Show me your mark sheet. And the son says, Aapne aapko Einstein samaj rakha hai, jo aapka bachcha pass ho ga, jab sabke bachche fail ho gaya, so how can I pass? I mean, as I said, some people are really good at making excuses. Rather than telling the right answer, he moved around and so forth. So, uh, giving me up excuses is again is a kind of mentality where we want to shun away responsibility. Right? You understand shun away? We don't want to take it. We want to, you know, give it up. Uh, a brief note on procrastination. I would recommend 
Procrastination is a subject matter where you really pay, pay attention. People at large today are committing suicide. They say relationship issues. They say dissatisfaction in professional life. But I'll tell you, those are superficial reasons. The main reason why people end up committing suicide, the main reason why people end up you know, getting into depression, frustration, or any sort of negativity is primarily because of procrastination. It's a subject matter which we can discuss at length. I may not have time today, but quick thing. There are two kinds of procrastinations that we do in our life. Procrastination of things that has a deadline. Just like today's talk, I was telling them, you know, for last one and a half year, one and a half year ago, I wrote this article. And all this while I've been thinking, I should, you know, make a whole presentation out of it. And when Anjali had called me or messaged me that, you know, you have to speak for one and a half hour, then I thought it's a design school. I should speak something about designing. Then I really put my feet down and I had to do it. So I've been procrastinating for so long. But because it was an item with a deadline, I just finished it in the parking of this college. When we drove here, I told uh, the, uh, the, the, our friend who drove us here, I said, can you just give me five minutes in the car? I'm still finishing my PPT. But the point is, I finished it because there was a deadline to it. Now, this is the thing that I want to focus on. There are many things, far much more important things in our life for which there are no deadlines. And those are the things that we keep on procrastinating day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and eventually builds up into such a frustration and depression which forces the person to commit a suicide. Can you think of anything which is very important to you but has no deadline? Which is very important to you but has no deadline? Any guesses? Your professional career? Yes or no? Does profession come with any deadline? Your health? Does it come with deadline? What about relationships? Does it come with deadlines? Now are you seeing the connection when people say that he committed suicide because of the relationship crisis? He was dissatisfied in his job, he was so and so. Actually what had happened with him, he was not able to take responsibility of his life. When the opportunity was there for him to act and work on it, he didn't. He kept on procrastinating on the things which was most important to him and because of which such drastic results happen. So in essence, so give up on excuses and procrastination. Oh, interesting quote. A procrastination is like a credit card. It's a lot of fun until you get the bill. Yes? I mean, I don't want to ask you here, but I can tell you about myself. Uh, I didn't do it in America, but I did, definitely did it in India when I was studying here, doing my undergrad. We suddenly used to realize that something happened in the last six months in college, just a day before exam. Do you relate to it? And suddenly we would do that something which is unthinkable. Seven days straight, night outs. And on the eighth day, you would look like a walking zombie in the campus. You all are laughing, probably you relate to it. Please don't do that, huh? It's not good for health. That's the point about it. Third, give up unhealthy lifestyle. <coughs> so if you want to live a healthy lifestyle, there are three quick things that you need to have. Eat healthy, have a proper rest, and engage in some kind of physical activity. Just like we did a small exercise during this. If you keep on sitting like this, and if I keep talking like this, you probably wouldn't mind. Why? It's too comfortable to be sitting in the environment. Anyways, I'm not picking out on anyone, those of you in case sleeping. So it's too comfortable to sitting out here and taking a rest. So have some physical activity, take proper rest, and sleep in, um, yes, sleep in time and eat healthy. So some of the things that I'm going to you know, quickly rush through. So this is one of that. So take care of your health and start working on your needs, interests, and concerns. <coughs> Give up on the fixed mindset. It's almost close to six. How far are you doing with the time? How far do you have to? You tell me the time, I'll close with that. Okay. Well, it's a big topic. I'll quickly rush through with it. So, give up on the fixed mindset. What is that fixed mindset? Generally, people with this idea, okay, let me do it other way around. I'll give you a story because otherwise it'll take time. Um, so there was a, it's a, it's a story of a twin brothers. 
again there was a group of scientists who were trying to study the in impact of alcohol on the life of an individual and the life of a family so they found a very interesting family a family in which a father was an alcoholic and that family had twin brothers now when i'm saying twin brother why it was so important for the scientists because as being a twins they had the same set of genes they had the same set of genes so their physical composition that led to them to be a twin was same so that was of a very interest to the scientists and what happened let's say there was a son a and son b what they saw in their house was a father who was an alcoholic they saw a lot of alcoholic or the liquor bottles in the house and they also saw their father drinking an alcohol and when they both grew up when they both grew up they took two different paths son a as usual became an alcoholic just like his father son b became a successful businessman in fact so much so that he never ever drank liquor in his life and that's the reason this case study became very interested for the scientists and the scientists went to them and interviewed them they asked the son a what happened it was a same environment same situation conditions are same for son a and son b how both of you ended up into a two different you know result son a said well answer is very simple my father is an alcoholic there used to be a lot of liquor bottles and i used to often see him drinking of course i understood that i can't do anything better than that shut up can i the packy is running out of the power so he said it was obvious that you know because this is what i'm supposed to do this is what i said then the scientist asked son b he said how did you ended up being a successful you have never drank a glass of liquor he said i saw my father being an alcoholic i saw a lot of liquor bottles around i also saw him drinking but i also saw the consequences of drinking liquor and i decided for myself i will not end up becoming like him and i decided to learn a lesson from the situation about the drawbacks of drinking liquor and grow in my life this is the difference between fixed mindset and what is called as growth mindset are you getting it here a person with a fixed mindset he thinks his success entirely depends on his skills on his talents not on his hard work okay i'll again repeat a person with a fixed mind uh, mindset thinks his success in his life depends on his skills and talents not on his hard work when he meets a failure his response is i cannot do better than this in case if you ever had an experience with yourself saying like this while meeting a failure that i cannot do better than this this is called a fixed mindset what is a growth mindset a successful person carries a growth mindset now what is a growth mindset person is not dependent entirely on the skills and talents yet they are important but he is willing to work hard for it when he meets a failure a failure becomes an opportunity for him to improve and succeed better the next time how many of you have heard the classic story of tortoise and a rabbit and having a competition between them all of us have heard that in this tortoise and rabbit story one of the character is having a fixed mindset and one of the character is having a growth mindset i'm not going to give you the answer that's for you to think a tortoise did not rely only on its skills he was patient he did not took any break during the race a rabbit was so confident of his skill he was thinking my skill is enough to get me a success and tortoise can never win me that's the reason when he drove very fast he took a break and he slept extra yet tortoise was working hard he didn't take a break <coughs> he continued on and ultimately he won so i guess this is i have given you enough hints so among the tortoise and a rabbit who has a fixed mindset yes the rabbit is having a fixed mindset although he had the skills ultimately he failed and of course it's a tortoise who was having the growth mindset so give up the fixed mindset and have a growth mindset we can't control the circumstances and we don't always get to choose what happens to us or around us but we can try our best remember who you are today is not 
who you have to be tomorrow. Give up your perfectionism, which means unless I am able to do, unless the results are expected, uh, until I receive, achieve the result as I expect it to be, until the environment, the conditions, situations are like I want it to be, I will not work. And that becomes a fear factor which allows a person, rather than moving forward, rather chokes a person and again gives up an attitude and gives an attitude of, I cannot do it. So, don't let fear of, fear of failure distract you from moving forward. Give up on irrational beliefs. Overnight success is a myth. In one forum I was talking, uh, speaking on the same subject matter to a student body. It was a different s environment and situation. And one person asked me a question, one student asked me a question. Sir, you told us in the class that belief system, power of belief. And if I believe in something, I can do it. Are you telling me that if I climb up my window and if I begin to do this visualization that I am the Superman, Spider-Man, then I'll become one day a Spider-Man or super, uh, Superman, Superman. You know, if I begin to visualize myself, are you telling me that one day I'll become a Superman? I said, even if you go on visualizing the same thing for the next 30 years, when you jump out of the window, you will not fly, you will fly dead. This is the idea of the irrational beliefs. You saw in the case of Roger, he did not set up a belief that I will run a mile in two minutes. What did he say? I will run a mile in three minutes, 59 seconds. That's the difference between irrational beliefs and rational belief. And that's the reason I said, I'm going to give a word of caution when we talk about belief. You may want to give up everything, give up. But don't give up on common sense. Please keep it to your heart. It's very, very important. All right? Give up on multitasking. It's a common myth these days. People say we should do multitasking, but that's not the reality. I don't have the time to do an exercise. Maybe I can share that exercise with Anjali ji and she can forward you later on. I'll give you one quick example of a study which was performed on a Microsoft employees. And they noticed if a Microsoft employee while working, if their work gets interrupted by an email, it would take for that person at least 15 minutes, 15 minutes to regain the train of thoughts. A study performed on Microsoft employees, they found if a person while performing a task, performing his work, if he gets an email and he gets interrupted by it, and he gets distracted by it, it takes at least 15 minutes <coughs> to regain the train of thoughts. Now can you imagine you're sitting in a class, you're trying to do multitasking, which means you're busy on your smartphone and you're trying to hear to the lecture. No wonder the response would be at the end of six months, class mein kuch padaya hai? Of course, because we could hardly hear it, the distraction, so don't do multitasking. And second thing that they found out, our attention does not immediately follow. It takes a certain amount of time, so which means when we do this multitasking, which is also called a switch tasking, when we do this, it leads to three things. It takes much longer for us to do the task. Generally, we think by multitasking, I can accomplish more. That's not correct. It takes much longer time. It decreases our quality of work. and it creates more personal stress in our life. Another thing that we need to give up on is to need of control everything. Detach from things you cannot control and focus on what you can. We may not have control on the situations but we do have on our responses. Work on improving the responses. A very beautiful quotation by Saint Francis of Assisi. He said, oh my dear Lord, give me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. I'll again repeat, my dear Lord, give me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Give me the courage to change what I can and give me the wisdom to know the difference. I guess it sums up this particular topic. Give up the fear of change. The change is inevitable, acknowledge and grow with it. Quickly running with the one quick case study on it. How many of you have ever used Nokia mobile? Oh wow. How many of you have Nokia with you right now? Incredible. 
Almost 80% people had their hands high when they said they used Nokia. But none of you have their hands high now when I asked how many of you have Nokia. See, I come from the smartphone field. I was a security engineer or research engineer in the field of smartphone security. When I graduated, for us, our dream company was Nokia. Our dream company was BlackBerry. Apple was not even in the market. Let me tell you something what happened with Nokia because of which you don't have Nokia, Nokia today in your pocket. The fall of Nokia. In 2007, suddenly Steve Jobs announced that they're releasing a first phone called as iPhone. What do you call as iPhone XS? That was iPhone first model release, which was the first ever touch screen mobile release. They released it until 2007. Nokia had a 70% market share in the mobile market all over the world. Within two years, that market share fell to 10%. The 70% market they owned up to 2007, for 10 years they ruled the smartphone or the mobile industry. They never ever thought that they can ever go wrong in anything. And we all have loved Nokia phones, right? Yes. At least in those bygone days, not now. For their robustness and whatnot. And suddenly because they did not change in time. They adapted to the change but they were too slow for that change and also they didn't do everything that was needed. They didn't adopt it to the right operating system and so forth. Eventually it came to a situation where in 